I, I, okay, and I just heard recordings in progress, so we're good. Um, All right, so again, um, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are, good evening. I uh, was on a call yesterday where we had people all around the world, so there were people in the middle of the night. Uh, anyway, I, I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you, Sarah and Sophie, for, for inviting me uh, to, this, to, to open this uh, public seminar. I, I'm very conscious that I'm the first speaker in this series, and I hope I can meet the expe your expectations and uh, uh, set a good example for the people who are coming, because there are some really great people. I was looking at the schedule and some really interesting talks coming up, and I hope people will participate. My goal today is to provide a framework for thinking about public engagement. Just a couple of key principles illustrated um, over time uh, that I hope will give people uh, some sense of how to approach thinking about public engagement, its many parts and its many goals. And to do that, we have to start by saying, you know, what, what is this thing we're talking about? Um, this series is called not a public series on public engagement, but it's a series on science communication. So the question becomes, what is science communication? And typically, if you ask someone what science communication is, they think in this fairly linear kind of way. You, you have stuff that's out in the lab, the work that happens in the lab or the field, depending on the kind of work. You present it at meetings or pre, maybe it circulates as a preprint. There's in the background, people are writing grants about the work. But finally, it comes out in this formal paper, it's published. And only then is it science, right? Only then do we think, oh, this is the real thing. And after it becomes science, then it goes out to the media, whether we're talking about traditional print media or social media, uh, television, radio, whatever version you want to think of as media, goes, it's packed down science, it goes out into textbooks and would it get used in policy documents? Now, if we were all in person, I would ask you to sort of raise your hands or I'd be able to tell how many of you are nodding your heads. Uh, I'm not gonna try to see how many thumbs up there's going or anything, but this is the way we often think of science communication. It turns out when scholars look at it, it's a little bit messier, right? It ends up being uh, this gigantic web or, or sphere of science communication. I, I call this a sphere. Uh, you can, if you look carefully, you can see an X, Y, and Z axes there. Uh, we still have the lab and the field and the preprints and the journals going out to the media, but we also have direct connections between the lab and the field and the news media. And of course, we have everything else there as well, government reports and websites and artwork and um, visitor centers at parks and patents. And, and what you notice is all of these things are interconnected and these arrows are double-ended. It turns out when we actually try to track the flow of information in science, it's not a linear process, it's a much messier process. Any individual link is less critical than trying to understand just this interconnectedness. So even, so that's the first key principle is that the stuff that happens in science and the stuff that happens outside of science, that's actually not the way to talk about it because there isn't an inside and an outside. It's all, it's all intermixed. If we focus on the more public side of it, Again, we run into this uh, label problem. We have science communication as one label. We have public engagement with science, the label I'm using today. We have informal science education, people who come out of the education world will call it. And a few years ago, when the American Academy of Arts and Sciences tried to, did a big project to help scientists understand this field, they produce this diagram. It's just these overlapping triangles. And 
maybe there's some slight differences among these the these different labels but the majority of these fields overlap An, another project at about the same time something called the center for the advancement of informal science education or case uh, which was funded by the NSF, actually just finished up its work uh, a couple of months ago. Again, at, um, when they tried to list these things and they listed out specific activities, whether we're talking about museums or educational TV or science journalism or public information activities of, uh, of universities, they ended up with these overlapping circles. And you know, some things are more on the education side, maybe the things that happen at zoos and science centers, and maybe some things they called are more on the information side, the journalism, but there's an awful lot of things in the middle there and you could slide things around. And you know, how, would you, uh, how would you talk about, let's say a science, news, a, a sort of new science activity that happens to get presented at a museum. Uh, the point was very hard to distinguish among these. So for the rest of this talk, I'm mostly going to use the term public engagement, but I, I'm using it in the most comprehensive uh, sense of capturing all of the all of these things. Now there's a whole separate talk I could give about the meanings of public engagement. It's a term that a lot of people use without breaking it down. And I think that's a mistake because I think sometimes there's a lot of times when people talk past each other uh, and, and don't realize that they aren't necessarily talking about the same thing. So I think of there being four different kinds of public engagement, four different meanings. And the first one of these, and the one that many people think of, is what we'll call educational engagement. This is the idea that we want people engaged in our work. We want them excited. We want them to learn. We want them to, to really be paying attention. That's engagement. And there's a very strong literature in the, in the educational world about this kind of engagement um, and how it uh, is affected by attitudes and behaviors and, uh, and so on. The second kind of engagement, and the one that's perhaps more common in an STS world, is what I'll call democratic engagement or participatory democracy. We want people engaged in science because we want citizens to be making decisions. We want people have to, in, in our democratic societies, we want people to be able to participate in making decisions about energy or food policy or transportation policy or, um, environmental issues or, or so on. And then we want public engagement in those aspects of science. That educational engagement and the participatory democracy engagement are different ways of thinking about the field. They're both usually called public engagement, uh, but they are, I think, sometimes talking past each other. The third kind of engagement is public engagement in science itself, in doing science, public participation in scientific research, what's often called citizen science. We'll say a little bit more about that later. But again, that's a different meaning. There's a fourth kind that I won't talk about very much today. It's called institutional engagement. Uh, at a science museum, they want you engaged in science. They also want you engaged in that institution. They want you to come back. A science, popular science magazine wants you to be engaged in the information, educational engagement, but they also want you to buy their magazine or come back and click on their website and, and get a subscription to their website. So these are, that's an institutional engagement. We're going to focus on the top three today. So the title of my talk is the past, present, and future of engagement. So we're now going to go into the past and, and look at what, how did we get to where we are and where might we be going? Uh, I am originally a historian of science, so that's, I, I like the history part. Uh, if we think, and if we look at the history, what we're going to see is mostly the educational engagement. 
And we see that there, you know, as with any historical pattern, we can see it going back hundreds of years. But for what we think of as public engagement today, it begins around the beginning of the 19th century and with the development of the modern form of museums. This is Charles Wilson Peel. He was the founder of what was called uh, one of the, what's generally considered the first American museum. And I'm sorry, most of the examples I will give today will be American. That is what I know best. Uh, what was interesting about his museum was that up until the time it was created, museums were just jumbles of things. And he was the first to create some kind of organization to his museum. And he used the Linnaean system for how to organize the various bits of natural history that were displayed in his museum. So the science part was there essentially from the beginning. By the um, middle of the century, we start having these major institutions that are tied to knowledge. So in the US, the Smithsonian Institution was created in 1846 for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. So the increase, the research, and the diffusion, the spreading. And in its early years, it didn't do much spreading. It was mostly about being a repository for information, for doing original research. Similarly, with one of the great natural history museums of the United States, um, the American Museum of Natural History was largely about research collections and the developments in that museum were some of the great early displays of dinosaurs or the development of dioramas. That doesn't really come until much later, until the beginning of the 20th century or the turn of the 20th century. There's work showing that the, the rise of natural history museums around uh, throughout the 19th century was not really about displaying information. It was about gathering and controlling information, often in imperial contexts, often it was a tool of colonial power. Um, but it's important for us to see that this mix, and this is why I emphasize that web or sphere of science communication, that the collection and the display were intermixed and they weren't always what we think of today as public institutions really began largely as research institutions. But those institutions often did have public communication as part of what they did. The Royal Institution in the UK and Britain, um, famous for its Christmas lectures. In this uh, famous illustration, we have Sir Michael Faraday presenting to um, Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria and their son, Prince Alfred in 1855. But the public lecture, a long tradition uh, within the science community. What changes in the second half of the 19th century is industrialization and the growth of uh, the economic growth that comes with that uh, and the needs both to provide things for people to do when they have leisure time, and also for some sense of social control. So we get the rise of public schooling movements. So it's no longer just the rich who can be educated, but uh, everybody has access to education. In the United States, we have the rise of what we call inventors magazines for people who are have the ability to tinker, um, the magazine Scientific American most famously started that way and really was that for a hundred years. In the UK, there are mechanics institutes. These are uh, like that big brick building there uh, at the bottom, uh, which are places for the, both for workers to learn some science and technology that they could use in business, but also as a, as a place for them to be uplifted, to be uh, inculcated in some of the values of science. In countries like the United States, which have vast spaces to cover, we have itinerant lecturers who wander from town to town, uh, often using science. And this, the illustration in the middle there is a glass blower. 
uh, who would go from town to town illustrating principles of physics and also selling things that he made. Of course, it was usually he, it's is a gendered time. The rise of what's called rotary printing when you no longer have to print one sheet at a time, but you can put a big roll of paper that comes about in the middle of the 19th century, leading to a tremendous growth in printing and the penny press and popular books. Uh, the astronomer Flammarion in France, uh, sometimes considered one of the founders of popular science writing. And what all of these things had in common was a tension between providing information and, create, and providing spectacle that would draw people in. This is one of the big challenges of educational engagement. Is it about providing information or is it about getting people excited? Um, it's both there, it's not a sharp line, but it's something that we need to, to be aware of. When we come to the 20th century, now we begin to get a, a lot of variety. Uh, we get the rise of the public health movement. Public health as a field begins in the 19th century, but the use of, me of media, mass media as a tool for spreading health information uh, becomes very wide. And it's not just doctors it's, it, um, or health campaigners but they look for all kinds of tools. So one of the things, in, again, here in the United States, there was a kind of insurance, it was called industrial insurance, that life insurance that was sold to workers. It's not for the upper classes, it's for workers. It was very cheap, just pennies at a time, um, basically enough money so that when someone died, you could pay for their funeral. Um, but they had a network of sales agents who went out to uh, to collect the set, to sell the policies and collect the the premiums every week, and so they built a relationship with their with their customers, and they realized that they could use this as a distribution tool for public information for public health information. So campaigns about diphtheria or tuberculosis, this uh, uh, magazine called the War on Consumption. This is from the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, in which you have the beacon, it's the beacon of the company, that tower is, was their symbol, but of course that's also supposed to be the beacon of science, banishing tuberculosis into the darkness on the side and protecting the family uh, there. In the early 20th century is when we get the the development of science communication as a field, people who begin to think of themselves as science communicators. E.E. Uh, e. Slauson, who's off on the left there, was a chemist who spent almost no time in his career as a working chemist. He became a chemical popularizer. He, he gave lectures, he wrote textbooks. That book, Creative Chemistry, was distributed to every school in the country and sold widely. And he was the first director of something called Science Service, which was created around 1920 and was a news syndication service where journalists who specialized in science would write about science and distribute those stories uh, to newspapers around the country. Those articles were also collected into a little magazine or initially called Science Newsletter that magazine still exists, a little magazine called Science News. And there, the organization, Science Service, ha, is now called the Society for Science. In the United States, in the 1930s, when the Professional Association, the National Association of Science Writers was founded, uh, there were about a dozen members when it was founded, and half of them came from Science Service. So it was really this nucleus that took off and there led to the, to the growth of a professional field of journalists who covered science. Not talking about the museums, that's all happening on the side as well. Now, what all of these educational engagement efforts have in common was a belief in progress, a belief that science was a fundamental necessity in a modern society to move us forward. 
This is the frontispiece to a book published in 1937 by uh, Cressy Morrison. The book is called Man in a Chemical World. And the caption for this illustration says that chemical industry upheld by pure science sustains the production of man's necessities. So you know, classic stereotyped image. We have our lovely woman in the blue dress. That's pure science. Um, the woman is purity. You know, these are all, you know, one can, one can do many books on some of the imagery here. But the point here is there is a real sense of progress and of science being a fundamental piece of how we move forward. Science itself was something that one had faith in, that was a, a fundamentally a good thing. And, and science museums at the time from built through the 20th century were these temples <clears throat> to science. So the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry, this massive building, the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia with these giant columns, many of these buildings have columns. You can all think of the examples in your own cities and countries. And there were these people who were these professionals who were moving around, who were committed to these. So Waldemar Kempfert, who was uh, originally a translator, a technical translator, and then eventually became a science writer, a managing editor of that Scientific American that was still an inventor's magazine. Then he became the editor of the magazine Popular Science Monthly. And then in 1925, he became the science editor for the New York Times. He did that for about five years. And then he moved to the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry. He was the founding director there. And I highlight that to show how there was this person who was, you know, he was talking to inventors, he was talking to the general public, he was using museums as a tool to promote science. The, I actually have recently um, acquired, somebody has donated to Cornell Kempfert's papers, and he was in conversation with leading scientists of the day to find out what they were doing, to challenge them. He saw science himself as part of the scientific enterprise. Um, he only spent a couple of years in Chicago. He went back to the New York Times and worked there into the 19th for another 40 years. Uh, until shortly before his death in the mid 1950s. Now, since I am virtually in Vienna, uh, even I don't know where all of you are spread around, you know, Vienna has one too, the Natural Muse History Museum, that is this gigantic, um, uh, imposing temple to science uh, and with the massive staircases in the middle. And like so many museums, it has its iconic. Uh, entry spaces. So uh, this is a picture I took about 15 years ago when I was in Vienna um, of this lion. I, again, if I were in the room, I would ask those of you who are there, is that lion still there? Is that still the iconic entryway um, to the museum? But part of the point about these temples is that they illustrate science as part of our culture what the French call culture scientifique, the idea that science is just something that we see embedded in our culture. So what's interesting is a couple of other photos that I took on that trip, which are people taking pictures of themselves at the, mu at the museum, right? Or on, that, on those staircases. That's what you would do. You wanted to show that you were part of this culture. It's not that they were interested in the science or the animal. They were interested in saying, this is part of what we do as a participant in our culture. So this brings us now into the present. Um, I'm calling everything since World War II the present uh, for our purposes here. Um, where we have more or less the science communication world we see today, where we have newspapers and magazines and websites. And of course, you can either get your news through the computer or through your mobile device, right? This is the same story, but this time it's on the, on the mobile device. Where we have popular science books, uh, that become part of culture. Um, Hawking's Brief History of Time, plays, theater, um, Michael Frayn's Copenhagen, 
books that aren't quite as prominent, but are sort of things that people pick up and read. One of our ones a few years ago was Longitude. Um, but again, these were parts of culture, things you were supposed to do. If uh, Again, if we were all in the same room, if I look at Hawking's brief history of time, and I would say, how many of you have picked up Hawking's brief history of time? And I'd be willing to guess that at least 75% of you have at least picked it up and leafed through it. And then if I said to you, how many of you have finished Hawking's Brief History of Time? And maybe there would be two of you who had finished it. This was a book that you were, everybody knew you were supposed to have read this book if you were a cultured person, um, but you didn't necessarily have to understand it. You had to engage with it in the sense of connect with it. It's part of what we do as a member of our culture. But it wasn't a democratic thing. It wasn't a doing research. It was just connecting um, with it. All of that shows us that we have popular science happening, people engaged. But what happens in the second half of the 20th century is that we become, we begin to recognize some of the challenges that science provides in our society. And so even earlier than in the first half of the century, we have Charlie Chaplin uh, caught in the cogs of modern industry. We have the, the Cold War and worries about nuclear war. I realize I'm speaking to people in Europe where that may be um, a more present concern today than it has been for, for decades. Um, this is a really challenging thing for us to recognize the the destructive power that science allows. Um, these kinds of uh, atomic um, warnings of what to do in case of an atomic uh, attack. When I was when I was a school in, in school in elementary school, I went through drills where we were supposed to climb under our desks and cover our heads in case of a nuclear flash. The fact that in fact we never we would not have survived um, was something that was of course hidden. The beginnings of the environmental movement in the 1960s in the United States, the first in, um, environment day in 1970. Um, these were the times when we began as a society, we began to challenge science and question whether we should always view science as a good thing. And so that's what then takes us to the, the idea of public engagement is something that we might study and something that we will try to have a better understanding of. On the left is the report, Public Understanding of Science, published by the Royal Society in 1985. It's often called the Bodmer Report after Sir Walter Bodmer, who was the chair of the committee. And that was a, that was a report from uh, the scientific community <clears throat> worried about whether people were understanding science, worried about the questioning of science that was coming out of the 60s and 70s, um, worried about whether people knew enough about science. There have been reports like that going back generations. What was different about this particular report was that it generated some action. And that group in the middle, um, the Science Policy Support Group was a, uh, a a small agency project funded as a result of the Bodmer report, led by scientists, but led by scientists who were quite thoughtful about society. I've highlighted here John Zyman, who was a physicist, who already in the 60s was thinking about the social dimensions of science, calling it public knowledge. It's not actually science until it's been made public and reliable knowledge. And the Science Policy Support Group supported a bunch of research that we think of today as some of the origins of research in public understanding of science. Initially, some original articles, Sarah kindly mentioned that I was the one of the, uh, I was the second editor of the journal Public Understanding of Science. That journal was created in part to publish the work that came out of the Science Policy Support Group. 
Some of that work was collected in the Irwin and Wynn Misunderstanding Science from 1996. And this is the time when we begin to see that uh, we have to ask questions about what do we mean by understanding? What do we mean by engagement? Uh, what happens when we don't think about public understanding just as delivering information, but as citizens or, or people who aren't even citizens engaging with material, questioning material, challenging material, bringing their own knowledges um, and so forth. And it sort of culminates in the kind of world we have today in a 2000 um, when the, the um, House of Lords in the UK issues a science and society report that, that says we have to pay attention to public engagement. Um, although precisely what they meant by public engagement is again, a little ambiguous. If you go back and, and read the report, whether it's that educational engagement or this more participatory kind of engagement. But certainly the scholars who came out of that work and some of whom were involved again in a tight collaboration with the scientists, Brian Wynn was on that House of Lords uh, committee as was John Durant, the founding editor of the journal, Public Understanding of Science. What they meant by public engagement was this participatory democracy, that we want more citizens involved in helping make decisions. And that led in the 2000s and the 2010s to, to a lot of these experiments with consensus conferences or expert panels or collaborative activities. Uh, I said Brian Wynn was on the House of Lords Committee, Alan Irwin, the other editor of that Misunderstanding Science, uh, published his book Citizen Science in 1995, um, trying to see how you could get more citizens involved in issues of sustainability. But that label of citizen science, which Alan Irwin probably meant in the sense of participatory democracy, Oops. Um, was also the key around that time to the beginning of what we now call citizen science in the sense of public participation in research. Some of that was tied to um, uh, the idea of what's called popular epidemiology, where people began to see cancer clusters that didn't quite meet the standards of uh, uh, probability and 95% uh, confidence intervals and things like that, but which anybody looking at a map and saying there's a pollution site here and all of a sudden more people are getting cancer um, sort of began to challenge how we think about who gets to have that knowledge and who gets to produce it. But also we get the rise of citizen science in the sense of scientists saying, you know, I've got this project where I could, I would love to have a bunch of people help me gather data. And whether those are computer-based projects like the folding at home one where people uh, work out um, molecular structures on their computers, or whether it's people out watching birds or uh, taking notes when they're scuba diving about reefs or looking under rocks for um, salamanders or looking at the skies uh, as part of amateur astronomy or so on, that kind of citizen science, um, which has also grown tremendously uh, in the last 20 years or so. Educational engagement, of course, has continued uh, along. So we have this is my, my local science center, just a couple of kilometers from where I'm speaking to you. Um, very child focused, very exciting. Uh, my grandchildren will be visiting in a couple of weeks and we will take them down to the science center, uh, I assure you. Um, uh, but also science festivals, um, TED talks that are about science. Uh, the continuing news, the news sections that are about science. And of course, today, educational engagement taking place online through um, 
exciting, inspiring things that you can find on Twitter. This is the art of neuroscience. Um, TikToks, this was a little movie about ants moving leaves around. Um, fascinating stuff, interesting stuff. Uh, I didn't actually have a chance to put it in the slides. Just yesterday, I learned that one of the students here at Cornell University, uh, an undergraduate who does TikToks about climate change, somehow these things are apparently seen by millions of people online. And he was recently invited to the White House to speak to President Joe Biden um, about the youth and how they're addressing climate change. So this is, and that gets us, sees how these kinds of educational engagement slide into some of that participatory democracy. And of course, we have continued to have science as culture, whether it's Leonardo DiCaprio in movies like Don't Look Up or best-selling books about Henrietta Lacks, the origin of the HeLa cells. Also, some of these books, of course, pointing to some of our challenges, the racism that was inherent in how the HeLa cells were developed. We have TV shows like the Big Bang Theory. We have museums. This is the Oklahoma Museum, Oklahoma City. I love it because it's both a natural history museum with the dinosaur, but also an interactive hands-on science center. And again, the sense of it being part of culture, what you do. So down at the bottom there, that's my oldest son when he was 12 years old. He, my kids, of course, had to go to lots of science museums. I took them to many of them, purely professionally, of course, only for professional purposes. Um, but of course, they think that a science museum is what you do. So my son, who's now, a, who's a web designer now, he's not a scientist, but he, by the time his first son was a year old, he had been to a science center already. Because that's what you do when science is part of your culture, when you engage with science. That's the idea. So I'm nearing the end and I have to figure out what is the future of public engagement. Um, it's all the things I've just shown, right? It is educational engagement. It is public participation in research. It is um, science as culture, participatory democracy. Um, it's all those things and more. My slides have gotten too busy. I didn't even show you. Uh, science festivals and science cafes and um, people at visitor centers and so on. But the future of public engagement is also about these problems that we face in society. Um, headlines about floods, climate change related floods that are killing hundreds of people in Nigeria and Bangladesh and Pakistan, um, famine, uh, across the world, exacerbated by political and social events, but also tied to, to climate issues. Concerns about vaccination, concerns about pure science, about evolution versus creationism. I just read that a month or two ago in Sweden, um, there's been a controversy where a major politician has questioned evolution. So how do we do that? As we look at the future, and of course, as I said, I'm a historian, not a futurologist. We have to think about where do these big problems fit into public engagement? And these are what are called wicked problems. They're difficult to define climate change or um, famine. They are independent. There's lots of different causes at, at work. There's no single agency that you can work with to make it, to, to address it. People have tried various solutions, but they, they often fail. Part, they fail partly because we have to change people's behaviors. Um, we know there will be unintended consequences of any solution we come up with. And, and we'll never know whether the solutions we try were the right ones, because these problems are so big and so global and so pervasive that you can't run a controlled experiment. You have to go all in on doing away with fossil fuels, let's say, um, or if we choose to go with nuclear energy, we either go that way or we don't. We'll never know whether the other option would have worked. Um, so these wicked problems, of course, they're all over the place. Um, I have to say that I first 
made a, a version of this slide of almost 10 years ago, and I listed just vaccines and autism. Obviously, since the pandemic, um, we have to think about how that problem has intersected with global pandemics. But it's not just that, it's evolution and climate change and hydrofracking and uh, artificial intelligence and emerging diseases and neuros. I mean, all of these big issues that are much more than just education. They're ones that require that kind of participatory democracy. In some cases, will involve that kind of public participation in research, including bringing new knowledges into science, into our overall understanding of the world. And so if I have to say, what's the future, knowing that I'm not a futurologist, I think we will have more wicked problems about which we will need to have more educational engagement, but we will also have to have more dialogue, more participation, um, more participation in democracy. What we will really have to do is recognize the complexity that there's no single one of these things. And that what we're trying to do is understand and act um, in, uh, on all of these issues, which means we will need more research and more practice. Thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity. I'm looking forward to hearing Klaus's commentary and to the discussions that we will have afterwards. Thank you, Bruce. Um, yeah, Klaus, I think we will directly hand over to you. Um, as I said at the beginning, um, Klaus will offer a few thoughts and reflections for a few minutes before we open up for wider discussion. And Klaus, um, if you want to try sharing your screen, and if not, I can share your slides. Yeah, that works. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you, Bruce, for this wonderful, uh, complexifying talk. Um, um, I'll just try to come up with uh, a few um, footnotes uh, and some um, Austrian uh, things that uh, might be interesting for an Aust Austrian audience. Um, So um, history of science communications in, in Austria or, or more or less Vienna. Um, we have heard about uh, this uh, history of public engagement of science and science education and uh, science communication um, as uh, in the US or other European countries. It started in, in Austria and Vienna uh, in the second half of the 19th century. It was uh, maybe a bit later than elsewhere. Uh, we had then the first associations for the public engagement of uh, science, as we would say today, uh, the first journals for the popularization of science. Um, and Bruce already mentioned them. We had the first temples of science and technology were built around 1900. The Natural History Museum, we have seen it already, was opened in 1889. Here we have the Technical Museum um, of Vienna, which was opened in 1918. Um, what about local specificities? Um, in Austria, we see, as in other countries, a kind of um, coinciding of democratization or popularization of science and the democratization of the science of society. Uh, that is. The general right to vote for men was established in 1907, uh, for women in 1919. Um, and this really coincided with uh, uh, science communication as a kind of also of political education. Uh, so the one of the uh, messages, of course, was knowledge is power. And uh, a lot of the um, 
um, discussions going on about how to popularize science was to uh, create citizens that are able to vote and uh, uh, come up with the right decision when there are elections. So um, organized science communication in, in Vienna around 1900 was a mainly liberal and also leftist project. And interesting as we are talking now uh, at the University of Vienna, so to say, the University of Vienna played a crucial role in communicating science, beginning with the university extension in 1895. That is great popularizers came from the university like Mach, Boltzmann, Suess, um, and also uh, the university uh, uh, provided spaces for the popularization of science or the communication of science. Um, the university extension had its spin-offs um, and, and payoffs for the university. It was an income for lecturers to uh, teach the public. Uh, um, it created a good image uh, of the university in the public. So the nations came in because of this good image. Um, there were spin-offs like a popular science magazine, Das Wissen für Alle. You see uh, it, it's here with uh, uh, a kind of, as Bruce already mentioned, very emblematic figure of the progress, of course. Uh, this popular science magazine was mainly written by uh, lecturers from the university. And the university extension also led to the building of the first Volkshochschule or public college or public university in Europe and actually in the world with a very strong emphasis on science. So they were not allowed to teach um, Marxism or whatever, but really the natural sciences, uh, they had to be neutral, but the founders of these um, uh, folks of Schulz thought, well, this would help also for the political education to know more about science. Um, after World War I, um, there was a boom of science education, um, public engagement with science uh, in Red Vienna, but not um, in, in Black Austria, so to say. And this uh, took on for quite a while. Um, we had a revival of science communication and science communication policies uh, only in the 70s uh, with the first socialist government and the first um, secretary for science and research. Uh, before that, it was just the ministry or the secretary of um, education. We had first political initiatives to foster science communications, mainly top down, mainly PR for science and technology. Um, and we also had the first studies on the public uptake of science in, in 71, that's 50 years ago. Um, the diagnosis was um, that the awareness of science in the Austrian population could be much better. And this is just a quote from uh, the secretary uh, for science and research, uh, Hertha Fierenberg. Uh, 10 years uh, later, uh, she said that she did not succeed to change this. So the Austrian public is still more interested in art and culture than in science and research. And she hoped that further generations would change this. This actually did not change that much uh, as we um, found out in uh, the Eurobarometer um, uh, studies um, beginning in 2010 uh, and the, the recent one was in 2021 and almost in, in uh, every uh, category uh, Austria scored very low so we have the highest fear of negative impact of biotechnology, uh, least awareness that science is collaborative, least confidence and honesty of scientists just after Germany, uh, least interest in learning more about scientific developments just after Croatia and so on and so forth. Um, so seemingly there is a kind of um, uh, problem in Austria. So why should we care about uh, those uh, negative Eurobarometer results in, in, in Austria? Um, what, I, uh, what was clear from, from the, the, the latest uh, Eurobarometer survey was that there is a, a quite clear connection, uh, example giving, between the trust in science and uh, 
the, the vaccination rate again COVID, against COVID-19. Um, I just reported this week about uh, findings from the US, so back to, back to Bruce, um, which highlight this, this kind of uh, uh, connection. Uh, we have uh, above um, the uh, trust uh, or the confidence in scientific, uh, in, in, in science, uh, in the US um, uh, divided between the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, what was interesting to me is that still in the 80s, the Republicans, the, the, the committed voters would uh, be more confident uh, in, in, in the scientific community than the Democrats, but this has changed completely in in the last years. So it went up with the Democrats and went completely down with the Republicans. And this had quite an impact on uh, the excess death rates uh, um, during the pandemic, as you see uh, down below. Um, just before the pandemic, the uh, excess death rates of Republicans and Democrats were quite the same. Uh, at the beginning of the uh, pandemic, uh, more Dems were dying, but uh, when the vaccines became widely available, uh, the, of course, anti-vaxxers and vaccine skeptics within the, the reps uh, helped to uh, increase the numbers of Republicans dying. So we can just say, well, this is a kind of uh, cynically uh, naturalist selection, natural selection at work. But uh, I mean, this, this brings us to the also more general questions. Why should we not only care about the results of uh, Eurobarometer and, and uh, other surveys, but uh, about science communication, public, and, uh, public engagement with science, that is science, the public and democracy benefit from uh, uh, all these uh, efforts. And uh, I just come to my uh, last slides, uh, highlighting some uh, deficits um, in Austria. So there are lots of initiatives, but of course, uh, there are many things that should change in Austria, in universities, in schools, in the media. Uh, Bruce has shown us um, this, the science center nearby his home. Um, we don't have such a thing in Vienna. And uh, I just uh, um, leave you with uh, a quiz. Um, based on a book called The Geek Atlas about 128 places where science and technology come alive. And uh, so there is one place in, in Austria, in Vienna, uh, according to the author, where science uh, comes alive. And you might guess what it is. It's not the Natural History Museum. It's not the Vienna Technical Museum. Um, so it's the grave of Ludwig Boltzmann with the Boltzmann constant. Uh, this is uh, not to say that everything is bad in Austria and uh, that there are uh, not new initiatives like this course program, uh, but much more uh, could be done. Thank you very much. Great, thanks Klaus. Um, now I need to go and look at the grave, I think. Um, yeah, so thank you for those two really insightful talks. Um, thank you, Klaus, for giving a more yeah, specific history that I think is in dialogue really nicely with the, the broad themes that, that Bruce described. We have half an hour, 25 minutes, I think, for questions, comments, discussion. As I say, you can put your hand up using the, the tool in Zoom. Uh, you can put a question into the chat and I can feed that on. Um, Bruce and Klaus, you of course may have questions or comments for each other. So feel free also to, to follow up on anything that, that you were interested in, in the presentations. I actually have just have a quick comment. Klaus, I really appreciated your, your um, attention to the situation in Austria. And particularly I was interested in the references to the University of Vienna. There's a paper, which I hope is in press. I saw it delivered a couple of years ago, 
from Professor Deborah Cohen at Yale University, uh, historian of science and medicine there, in which she looked at the, um, the Vienna Circle and at the what was happening particularly in the 1930s, uh, and in which some of the popularizers were essentially pushed out of the University of Vienna because they were Jewish or um, uh, in other ways not approved by the Nazis. Um, uh, and, 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 but it highlighted both the, her, her talk and paper highlighted both the centrality of the University of Vienna for popularization in the early part of the century, but also tied it to these issues of what kind of democracy, um, what do changes in democracy or in governance of a country and the politics of a country do to our understanding of, of who gets to popularize and why they popularize. I don't think it's a question. It's more of sort of a comment and an expansion. Yeah, yes, uh, that's a wonderful comment. I just could extend on this. Uh, actually, I almost wrote the whole book on this story. So um, 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 maybe to begin with is that uh, in, in in Vienna at the University of Vienna we had the philosophical faculty until 1975, and in this philosophical faculty. Uh, we had the natural sciences and the humanities. And uh, the humanities always were stronger and they were largely biased politically, uh, were conservatives, right-wingers, anti-Semitic professors, and so on and so forth. And uh, the, the natural scientists had big problems because they could not have their professors even get uh, Jewish and leftist leftist scholars habilitated like Edgar Zilsel, uh, whom a uh, historian of science of course knows. Uh, and therefore Edgar Zilsel couldn't continue with his career at the university. And he was the most important teachers at these uh, Volkshochschulen uh, beginning in the, in the 20s. So, uh, um, and, and all the efforts by uh, the natural scientists in the 20s and 30s to, to also, popularize the natural sciences to make them stronger, also within Vienna Circle, uh, aimed at fighting the professors at the humanities at the University of Vienna. So uh, there was also a kind of uh, intricate uh, fight going on within the University of Vienna, uh, resulting in more efforts to popularize science. So it's a very wicked, complicated story, but I just can, um, um, uh, agree what 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 Debbie Cohen uh, seemingly has has told in a very correct fashion. Thank you. It, maybe I kick off the discussion um, by asking a question that that starts where you both finished. Um, so Bruce, you finished with this notion of wicked problems and the kind of challenges, the techno scientific challenges that are affecting our societies today. And Klaus, you also pointed out these problems that emerge from, from seeing the Eurobarometer results, so kind of distrust and uh, ambivalence towards science. And so if we are in this moment where there are these wicked problems, there are these profound societal challenges uh, that are connected to science and a lot of ambivalence uh, around those, what is the way forward for us as science communicators of, of different kinds or people who are interested in science communication? What strategies do you see being developed uh, and what could we and should we be doing? So I have an opinion. I don't know that I have any data to support it. Um, a lot of the educational engagement has been about, traditionally has been about what is the science? What is Boltzmann's constant? <laughs> you know, what, what is the equation? How do we understand the equation? What there hasn't been is a lot about the social and political context in which science develops. The stories that are about, not about, um, I don't mean, I don't mean sort of bad science that's caused by politics, but about the ways that politics are fundamental to science. That, for example, choices about, should we fund a space station or should we fund a, a, a physics a, a, a super collider? 
or should we fund public health? Right? Those are those are big social decisions. To vote for public health instead of public instead of a, a physics collider is not anti-science. It's a choice by society. And if we could have more popular science, more science communication that addresses those kinds of issues, that addresses the politics of the Vienna Circle and how that affected what work was being done at a particular time and who got to do science. Um, today, we would talk about, and I imagine when Emily Dawson talks in a few weeks, she will talk about um, issues of you know, who's allowed to see themselves as a scientist um, and, and so on. And so we can study that in the academy, but the question is, can we do museum exhibits and media stories and university public information and science cafes that address those topics? That will begin to help us see that complexity that is part of addressing wicked problems, I think. Yeah, Klaus, I don't know if you have any thoughts. Uh, of course, as a science journalist, I daily have these thoughts. Um, um, and uh, well, there are a few things that uh, Bruce already mentioned uh, that were on his, his last uh, slide. Uh, I think, first of all, we need not only uh, in general, but especially in Austria, we, we need more research about which kind of communication works, how, how could we address certain publics, uh, which formats do work, don't work, and so on and so forth. Um, second thing is, um, there is this huge challenge of the, the, the social media, at, at least as a, a journalist working for um, 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 a, a newspaper uh, we are confronted with, and and I mean, as Stephen Bannon uh, put it properly, I mean, they are, I'd say, uh, flooding the zone with with shit, especially in 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 the social media, but not only there. And I mean, what what we scientists, academics, uh, science journalists, science communicators should do is to try to clean this zone, this public sphere from, from this, this, this bullshit around. Um, of course, this is an upstream battle, but we have to do it as I try, try to do in my daily work routine as a science journalist, offer fact checks, uh, report properly uh, on how vaccines work. And this also includes, of course, this STS perspective, what I try to do uh, 20 years ago is uh, found a magazine called Eureka then uh, to do what also Stephen Shapin al already suggested in the in the first issue of the magazine public understanding of science to to teach or to to inform the public of how science is working uh, because this prevents a lot of misunderstandings about uh, you know, vaccine research and why vaccines uh, do work and don't work and so on and so forth. That uh, science is a is a, a very complex system, uh, has self-correcting mechanisms built in. And, and this is also something we have, uh, especially coming from the STS field, have to, uh, provide in the public sphere as information, how, how, how science is working. And, and this also then finally should create trust in what we in the media are reporting, what you in science at the university are doing. And this is helpful for the public, for democracy and for science itself. Thank you. Um, I know uh, just from the names of the participants, I know we, we have some people with a lot of experience in practice um, participating. So please, if you have any experiences that you want to share, I think that would be uh, great. Um, I can keep asking questions and being in conversation indefinitely. Um, so I, I, really I, 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 I was going to also say, if anybody wants to ask a question in German and then you can translate for me, that you know there may be people who are uncomfortable phrasing their questions in English. <laughs> 
Yeah, Sophie. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not an academic asking a question, not, not a practitioner, but maybe maybe after after I've been, actually you, you already have answered half my question, but I wanted to ask again because I mean obviously I'm coming from political research. So my I see a lot of parallels also in the Austrian science skepticism between science skepticism and lack, lack of media trust, right? So, and in that research, we know already for, for a long time that media trust, or not, not, we don't know, but there's evidence, right? That it's not about the actual performance of media, but it's about how politics talks about media, right? So what my, as a foreigner in Austria observation is that there's very little value in political debate about scientific efforts, particularly scientific efforts that do not fit into liberal marketplaces like philosophy and, and, and social science, which is, I, I thought I was surprising in Austria with this very strong uh, uh, tradition, right? This very strong history. So I don't know what your views would be on that. I mean, is it not just, I mean, the same in the US, right? How politicians and presidents speak about scientists matters greatly in how people see science and, and see the value of it and the value of a space rocket going into space costing billions of dollars or the value of a science philosophy department at the University of Vienna, uh, people don't share that observation. And it's not directly related, I feel, to science literacy. It's not that people don't know what science is, perhaps. So, I mean, not no, I mean, some people don't, but I mean, there's this research also showing that science literacy is not directly related to like, uh, you know, to polarization. It's not like people who don't know what science is hate scientists, right? So knowledge might not be the only answer. It's, it's perhaps also holding politics accountable and getting politicians to value science more. But I don't know how to do that. That's the question. <laughs> I don't know what your comments would be on that observation, but uh, I'm a foreigner to both the US and Austria. So, um, so, so I mean, I think you've hit on a really important issue, which is that it, and and why why it's important to think about different kinds of engagement. Um, it's not just not educational engagement. Just providing information is not going to solve the problem, whatever you think the problem is. Um, we know that we have now generations of data showing that um, there's something more complicated going on, as you suggest, having to do with politics. Uh, as Klaus said about different forms of media and how we, what we pay attention to. But we also, again, there's no simple answer. We were just with my graduate students yesterday, I was just, re we were just reading a paper about citizen science, which pointed out that some of the values that there's a, there's a virtue of citizen science, which says we get more people involved and that's fundamentally good. But there's also a virtue that says our goal is political change. And sometimes political change might come with fewer people involved, but more focused on a particular problem or with a particular set of skills to, to get the results that are needed. Um, and so part of our challenge is to understand not just what the media systems are, um, and find out how to use TikTok like this undergraduate at my school did. But to, to understand, I don't want to call it misinformation, to understand the values that are driving people who, who find science less useful or less important as a decision-making tool. Um, that's a research issue, but it's also an issue of practice because it matters who's going to present this, these for those of you who are practitioners, it matters which stories you choose to cover or which exhibits you build. Klaus, I saw you had some thoughts on this as well. Uh, I completely agree uh, and also uh, completely agree with the, the basic assumption uh, that um, the, the trust in uh, politics and the lack of trust in politics uh, for science, but also the public not trusting the, the politics and uh, the, the government uh, creates a lot of uh, collateral damage for the trust in the media and the trust in science. So uh, we know these recent studies on uh, the uptake of uh, COVID uh, vaccines against COVID-19 and uh, 
the, the trust in the political system. Uh, and of course, uh, Nordic countries uh, um, are much better because there is more trust in the government, in the state, in politics. Uh, and therefore, this also has a spillover uh, into the trust in science. Uh, and in Austria, unfortunately, we are facing uh, a, a complete erosion of trust uh, in, in politics nowadays, as we all know. And, and this has, uh, I fear, really, uh, and does collateral damage to the trust in, in, in science as well. And we in the university, in the media, we just have to fight for this trust again. Uh, Barbara. Um, thank you for both your contributions, really valuable. I want to pick pick up on the idea of who to trust and, and go back to the institutional engagement that you mentioned as, as one part. So who could be the allies of science communicators in terms of institutions? So when I, and when we're talking about politics, yeah, we're look, we're all looking uh, to Portugal to see what happened there. And basically, it comes back to one person, one politician, Mariano Gago, who was who's really a driving figure and a, a well-trusted figure that promoted science and also put institutions into practice that are still working 20 years later. And so where science is, is really embedded in in the population in a very, very long-term process, as I recently discussed with them again. Yeah. And so the question is, if we don't have that kind of person in Austria, and I don't see them at the moment, is what kind of institutions or who could be the, the allies that could work with us in terms of institutional engagement? And I'm speaking as a practitioner here mainly. Yeah. So, I mean, interesting to bring up the Portuguese. I spent two weeks in Portugal earlier this year, and, and I had the honor of meeting Mariano Gago many years ago um, before his death. Um, so for, it was the first time I heard a politician quote Steve Shapin correctly. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was fascinating. Um, what I actually thought you were going to say when you mentioned Portugal is actually looking at the COVID experience, where in addition to the popularization of public communication institutions, the uh, network, Ciencia Viva network that he helped create, Mariano Gago helped create. But of course, Portugal is also famous because in in COVID times, they had this admiral who came and organized the system. And that points to an institution, the military. It's not an institution that we typically think of, especially those of us in universities, um, as being one of our allies. Um, and yet it is an institution in many countries widely respected, an institution that in many countries is driven by science and technology, is very aware of science and technology, often the military academies are where some really great engineers and scientists come from. Um, I don't know that we've done enough as practitioners or as researchers about thinking about what are the ties between science communication, public engagement, and the military as an institution. But one possibility. Uh, Klaus, I don't know if you wanted to follow up on that. No. <laughs> um, then Hildrun. Hi, thank you for the possibility. Uh, thank you for the interesting talks as well. Um, I would like to address some something I've read about uh, last weeks. It's about um, like somehow negative uh, consequences, I don't know, but uh, negative issues coming along with uh, public engagement or science communication. And uh, this is some kind of power structure behind it. Like when we think about who's not participating, like uh, uh, minorities or low income people, and you don't have the possibilities often to engage with science. And uh, if we think more science is better for democracy and also for, for politics in general, then somehow it's like, excluding important parts of our society as well. So maybe you want to say something about this as well. 
mostly what I want to say is tune in on November 4th when when Emily Dawson speaks, <laughs> um, because she she has thought about this so deeply um, and, and so richly. Um, you know, I, I think actually this again actually is another point of the institutional and, and thank you, Barbara, for bringing it up. Um, one of the issues is that the institutions that we have traditionally turned to for science popularization or science communication um, are ones that are the institutions that are often mistrusted by marginalized populations because there are long histories of those institutions exploiting and, um, and harming, doing actual harm. Um, and this includes public, you know, in the United States, public health institutions have, and medicine has a poor reputation. So one of the things that that means is we have to turn to institutions that are trusted. Um, so one example that people have sometimes used is the churches, churches or other, or other faith traditions. Um, uh, that, and there are many people in faith traditions who are strong supporters of science, um, but we often don't think of them because that's faith, it's not science. Um, but if we find ways to collaborate with them, to find ways, I mean, one, one example someone's given is you want, a, you want a preacher, a really good preacher to talk about the beauty of the earth, and the, this incredible earth that God has given us and build to a crescendo. And then, and so we have this obligation to treat the earth well and to take care of it. And then you move into, into climate change issues. Um, uh, you know, just one example, but that we should turn, we should think about, actively think about what are those institutions that are not our institutions, but are the institutions that are trusted in those other communities and figure out um, how to how to connect with them? Hmm. I see in, in in Stefan's cathedral. Apparently, there's a vaccine booth there. There was also a vaccine booth in. Uh, they had a tram moving around the ring, I believe, where you could get vaccinated. I'm not sure whether that says that people have more faith in uh, Wien Mobile than in uh, other institutions in the city. Yeah. Klaus, uh, again, I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk um, yeah, about these issues. A, a very good uh, question. Um, and uh, first, I think we have to find out more about uh, these uh, uh, groups uh, which were not reached by science communication uh, or science so far. Uh, actually, we don't know a lot about them. so. Um, I'm just beginning a project with, with colleagues about uh, apprentices in, in, in Vienna, just to, to know how science is important for their life, how they um, uh, getting their information, how they use social media. Um, and, and, and then, the, of course, the next question is, we always associate uh, less trust in science with uh, the less educated. And I think this is also something we, we also should rethink, especially in Austria. Um, uh, uh, we saw it, I think, with the, with the uh, pandemic a, a little bit more clearly that, for example, uh, within general practitioners, we have lots and lots who are prescribing uh, homeopathy and uh, the uh, Austrian uh, Association for um, uh, Doctors uh, are promoting course programs on this pseudoscience. Uh, and there are a lot of well-educated, uh, I'd say, uh, green voters uh, who are completely against uh, all kinds of new technologies. Uh, uh, of course, they, they can be, but it's on a on a quite non-scientific basis. And so my appeal would be, we really have to first find out more about those groups and then how to address them differently and, and, and find out what would give them faith and how we could address them. <laughs> 
Thanks. I, I would also just again echo Bruce's comment to come in two weeks' time to hear Emily Dawson. So her title is Imagining Inclusive Engagement. And she I'm so looking forward to, to hearing her speak. She has done so much work on thinking about who was welcomed into science and science communication and who not. Um, so this is a, a pre-advert for, for that session. Constantina. Oh, uh, hello. Sorry, so um, this is uh, well beyond my field. I'm from natural sciences and also I'm, uh, I'm Greek. I'm, I'm in Vienna for a few years now. And uh, I, I think this is a global issue, but um, I find it very interesting. My worry is that, is it really a trust that the trust in science is not so high or the trust in scientists? So my experience, my personal experience, at least, and from a discussion from uh, uh, my friends and uh, people I know, it's that, that they, in recent decades, they do not trust scientists as people, as, the, as personalities, whereas in the past, it was a professor at university was very highly respected, and now it's not so much. And I'm, on, I'm concerned about the image of the scientist. How, how can we help that to improve that, especially when there, now it's everything that is done is so public and we see you know, all the everyday cases of, uh, not, not in Austria, no, in Austria is, the situation is very good, but internationally we see cases of harassment, of not inclusiveness and all of these things. So hey, Bruce, Klaus, if I could just ask you to respond quite briefly. Oof. Yeah, so I was gonna say, I, so I, I there, I, there is data, I believe, on the relationship between trust in science and trust in scientists. I, I, I don't know that offhand, so I don't want to misquote it. Um, what strikes me, though, is this is part of where, for example, telling human stories about scientists and why they do things. That's one of the ways you build trust is you're able to connect with people as individuals. Class. We are approaching two o'clock. Um, I want to be sure to wrap up on time. Um, so sorry to break off uh, what I think is a really important discussion, but I hope that this is one of the things that we can continue talking about um, in future lectures. Uh, I think this is, will be things that we come back to, uh, science, scientists, what makes them trustworthy uh, and how to ensure that. Uh, thank you so much. Again, um, Bruce and Klaus in particular, but to everybody for participating. Uh, what we hope, I think, is to see many of you uh, repeatedly over the next weeks. Um, we really look forward to continuing the conversation around these things. Um, so thank you. I hope you have time to get to your next meetings and see you in two weeks time. Thank you very much. <laughs>